my name is Hani Mansurian, and I'm the co-coordinator of the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. In this webinar, we will be talking about child protection in the context of coronavirus or COVID-19. We will have a very short presentation of the technical note that we have put out recently on this very topic. Once we are done with that, we will be turning to our speakers, Michael Copeland and Rachel Harvey, that I'll introduce at that moment, to tell us a little bit about what they're seeing in terms of needs and trends and patterns of child protection issues that are coming up from the field, and tell us a little bit about some of the innovations and solutions that they're seeing happening. And then we will turn to you guys for question and answer. The question and answer is, from our perspective, we hope will not be the typical question and answer because we would like you guys to also bring in your contributions. So it's not just you asking to answer your questions, but also sometimes you suggesting solutions. There are three specific questions that were mentioned in the final email that we sent. Not all of you might have received it because some of you are not on our mailing list. And if you're not on our mailing list, we encourage you to go on our on the Alliance website and register so that your email is put on our mailing list. So the three questions, which I will paste in the chat box. Question number one is, what child protection issues are you observing in the context of COVID-19? What are the things that you see in your context or in the context that you're supporting that is coming up that others should be aware of. What innovative ways are you using or are familiar with for protection of children in COVID-19 context? So you may have already seen or started using innovative ways of operating in this very difficult circumstance. What specific guidance you believe is needed to help child protection actors in, the, in their work? So this is the third question. So we would like you guys to tell us what you think is missing in terms of guidance, tools that, you, that will help you protect children better. I will give a little bit of background before I hand over to Sarah. As many of you know, Alliance is the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action is a network of organizations that work on protection of children in humanitarian context. The Alliance provides technical guidance and, and produces technical material to support the work of child protection practitioners in the field, policymakers, donors, and academics in, in this area. Just a little bit of background on where this technical note came from. As many of you are aware, in 2014 and 15, there was the Ebola crisis in West Africa, in primarily in three countries of Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, where I had the pleasure of serving myself in, in Sierra Leone and trying to do child protection work, which was interestingly in the beginning, extremely difficult. And it really resonates with the situation that we have today where it took us several months before we were able to put child protection at the center of the response and create partnerships and, uh, and collaborations with the health sector, who was deemed to be the, the central player in the, in the response. And a lot of the conversation that we're having today in terms of whether child protection and social welfare is something that should be prioritized sounds very familiar to the conversations we were having during the Ebola crisis, the West Africa Ebola crisis. And in the few months that we missed in having child protection be a central piece of the response, we ended up having a relatively large caseload of children who were separated in that process, who suffered traumatic experiences. Teenage pregnancy increased significantly in that period abuse and, and neglect increased in that period. It feels like we need as a sector to not make the same mistake in this pandemic and make sure that we advocate from the beginning that child protection is an equally important element of this response. Of course, the scale will be very different from the scale of the response within health, but deprioritizing child protection will have significant repercussions for children. In 2017, we started a process within the Alliance to develop a guidance note on protection of children during infectious disease outbreaks, because during the Ebola crisis, we realized how little guidance and lessons learned we have 
around the issue of protection of children in infectious disease outbreaks. As, as a colleague put it, a lot of what we were able to do during the Ebola crisis went against the grains of the CPMS, uh, the, min- the Child Protection Minimum Standard. So all of us were challenged in terms of what can and cannot be done. So we put together that guidance note bringing lessons learned from Ebola, from MERS, from SARS, from cholera outbreaks in different countries. When COVID-19 happened, we were not as helpless as we were when Ebola happened because we had already thought about this. But at the same time, it was yet another big challenge and a lot of unknowns attached to it. Therefore, we decided to start working on a technical note, which I hope all of you have seen. It's on our website. The technical note is a living document. We are planning to revise it probably about once a month, at least in the beginning, to make sure that all the learning and all the new information that is coming is reflected in that. It's it's an interagency product, so several of your organizations worked on it. And there's also being uh, several kind of side guidelines being considered. Some of the key areas, technical areas that that are coming up in, in our interactions with colleagues in the field are issues of alternative care. People are asking questions of how to deal with the issue of alternative care in this context. Children living outside of family care, including children in institutions, children living on the streets, children in conflict, conflict with the laws, including those in detention, protection of the child protection workforce. How do we make sure that our workforce is not put in danger? Capacity building and retraining of the workforce, role of child helplines in the response, and protection of children in armed conflict. I'm aware that a lot of the, the efforts that has been under underway, for example, on demobilization of children are now being put on hold because they basically physically are not able to, uh, to ensure the safety of, of these children. Protection of children in camps and informal settlements is a huge issue and worry for a lot of us. There seems to constantly be this question coming up of whether child protection is something that can be done in this context. And I hope by the end of this, by the end of this webinar, we have, um, we have an answer or at least a semblance of an answer to that, to that question. With that, I'm going to hand over to Sarah to walk us through the technical note itself. Thank you, honey. I hope by this time, all of you have had a chance to look at the brief, but I'm going to just present an overview of it. Basically, the target of the brief were child protection practitioners. And this was done deliberately with the understanding that there were other child protection actors who were developing other resources targeting parents and communities, for example, or that as it developed, we could develop these additional resources as annexes if need be. In terms of where you can find the technical note, we've created a short URL you can use to easily access the technical note. So it's a cpie.info slash COVID-19 note in case that you will be sharing this note with others or you want to find a very simple way of remembering where the note is. It's on our Alliance website. And then related to this technical note, if you scroll down, you'll be able to see that it's connected to an initiative that we have created. So all of the related resources, whether it's information about the webinar or other related webinars or other resources that we're developing related to the technical note, will all be stored together under that initiative on our on the Alliance website. Some initial stats, and these stats that I'll be providing are only the stats from the Alliance platforms. So we do expect the numbers to be quite significantly higher because the technical note has also been shared on platforms like UNICEF's websites, like the Enchanti website, MHPSS, the network for MHPSS. But so far, we've seen that more than 4,000 people have viewed the technical note itself. And then in terms of social media engagement and views, the views were close to 40,000 people and over 1,500 engagements with related material related to the technical note. It's clear to us that even in terms of the number of people who wanted to join this call, that there's a clear gap, a desire to engage in this conversation in terms of how can we best protect children during this time. So in terms of translations, the French, Farsi, Italian, and Chinese translations are done. Today, we'll be uploading the Arabic and Spanish and Korean version And then the Portuguese and Swahili translations are under development. For example, the Portuguese and Swahili, these are being done by 
partners who have expressed interest in ensuring that a translation of the technical note is also available in these languages. So if there's a language that we haven't translated the technical note into yet, and you have the capacity to be able to support that, please do let us know and we can send you the word file. So in terms of the structure of the technical note, it's divided into two parts. The first part looks at the child protection risks. First, from a socio-ecological perspective in terms of how it impacts the child and the family, the community, the society at large, and especially in terms of looking at the norms within that society. And then we break down the child protection risk according to some of the harms that has been listed within the, the 2019 edition of the CPMS. And there we look at what are these risks and then basically the cost, some of that risk, whether it's related to the prevention or response measures of COVID-19 or the actual disease itself. The second part, if you look at it, is divided into two parts, looking at as child protection actors, how can we work across sectors and with governments? And so there is a breakdown per sector in terms of guidance, in terms of how we can better engage with, for example, health actors, education actors, that so much of the work will require a multi-sectoral approach. In most contexts, we will also have to engage with government to ensure that issues related to child protection are being considered. And then the second part of the response part of the technical note looks at what are the child protection specific programs that we can do. And then there's a short table at the end in terms of resources. So basically, in terms of the key messages of the technical note, we're highlighting that COVID-19 disrupts the environment in which children grow and develop, and that there is negative consequences for children's well-being, development, protection. What's needed is that we need to advocate with governments, we need to collaborate with other sectors, and that there are specific child protection programs that we can engage in to ensure that children are protected during this time. In addition to mitigating risks that have been identified in part one of the technical note, we need to look at how to straighten the protective mechanisms. So these are the positive coping mechanisms that already exist within communities and families caregivers and children. As Hani has mentioned, this is a living document. So currently what's being shared is only version one. And we do expect this technical note to be updated as required. And that we would highly appreciate if you would send your feedback to cpi.info backslash COVID-19 note dash feedback on the kind of changes um, that you are seeing that you recommend for future editions of the technical note to include. So in brief, that's an overview of the technical note, and we hope that was helpful. Great. Thank you very much for this informative presentation. I would like to now hand over to Michael Copeland. Michael has been working in child protection for more than 20 years, and for the last three years has held the position of the global coordinator with the child protection area of responsibility, which is based out of UNICEF uh, in Geneva. Over to you, Michael, please. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, honey. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks, everyone, for taking the time. I think the, the fact that we've got 500 and could have had 500 more is a really good sign that people are recognizing the, the criticality that child protection is central to the planning and the response around COVID-19. So a big, a big thank you. I'll try and not repeat uh, some of the items that have already been mentioned, but perhaps give a few examples that we're already seeing. So I'm with the child protection area of responsibility and we're supporting coordination groups and those coordination groups are in humanitarian settings. But a number of things I'm saying today, I think are applicable for a broad range of settings. The first thing is just to note how much that context matters when we're reflecting on what are the current issues and what might be the child protection issues coming up in relation to COVID-19 because we're seeing COVID-19 arriving and being overlaid on very different contexts with the pandemic exploiting those existing vulnerabilities. For example, we might have strong national systems, including health systems that can put in place really robust health responses with facility-based quarantine, testing, and so on. And then, as many of you know, um, we'll have settings where that's not possible, where the health infrastructure and other government services are not able to mount a response or a coherent response. Displacement, conflict, people living in camps and settlements that has been mentioned. So in all of this, we need to think about also, I think the, the role that COVID-19 is playing in terms of 
political analysis and, and the potential that conflict itself may be exacerbated, or indeed if there are opportunities for that to be eased. So a few thoughts on, on what we're seeing, and I say this presenting the following material on the basis of our field support team who are all over the world and are frequently deployed all over the world. Many of them have had to move um, recently, but from feedback from coordinators as well, and as well as through our help desks who operate in French, Arabic, and Spanish, and English. So some of the issues that are coming up, the first is planning around the nature of the response and the health response, and whether that's quarantine centers, facility-based, home-based, and otherwise. And we heard mention around some of the risks around separation. So more generally, on alternative care and the different dimensions around alternative care, children who are currently in institutions, and that applies to some, some regions more than others in the world. And the precautions if children are staying in those institutions where we see a reduction in staff numbers and the safety for those children, risk mitigation, the need for child safeguarding, religious institutions holding very large numbers of children in boarding school like settings where children are there year round. So we've seen in some countries up to 160,000 children may be housed and more in such settings and plans for those children to come out of the settings. Children with vulnerable caregivers, so not just those that are elderly, but those with underlying health illnesses, disabilities, and so on, are a particular concern. So children who've already been placed with those children or children who are in the, in the process of being placed with those caregivers, what happens or what can we do in terms of planning planning for the weeks ahead. We see risks increasing already and reported in a number of countries. With that reduction in services and likely less monitoring and protection monitoring, the likelihood of sexual assault, rape, violence increasing, we're already seeing that. Also within that, we're seeing a reduction in services where children may have been able to access vital services, psychosocial support services as a, as a means and a, and a lifeline to contact others being reduced. We're seeing lots of questions about psychosocial support, of course, and how to adapt programming, mental health and psychosocial support in the context of social distancing. How do we have group activities, for example, with distance? How do we have remote modalities using technology, for example? Communicating to children, not just clear and accurate information and communicating in the right way based on their age and development, but also the potential that we need to communicate difficult news to children around the loss of loved ones. Other sectors where we're seeing lots of questions around camp management and camp coordination for those children and families, caregivers living in camps and settlements, health, obviously, WASH, um, obviously, and education as well. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the innovations that we're seeing. Preparedness, so how are we making sure that child protection is central to preparedness, which may or may not be, depending on the context, central to government, government's action. Duty of care to staff. So Hani mentioned, how do we keep staff safe? How do we keep staff well-being in mind? Staff who need to shift, relocate, change their working arrangements, look after others, take on additional load. So their well-being, including, including national staff. Program continuity overall, including issues, for example, around case management reprioritizing what are the most critical cases if that's possible thinking about case management where personal contact is critical at this time how can we do that safely so we're seeing examples of adapted programming for case management as an example some of the things that i would say are needed at this time in terms of an overall approach one is coordination it's great that everyone's on the call today and we're all hearing the same information and looking at the alliance technical note and we'll also speak about other resources working with others, sharing materials and coordinating for efficiency um, and to pull together at this time. Also to make sure that child protection is central to action. That's critical that we're coordinated. Working with other sectors I mentioned, and that involves advocacy as well. And beyond advocacy with other sectors also in terms of humanitarian response, preparedness I mentioned. Working with government counterparts at this time, and this involves the parts of government responsible for child protection, and that can be many, but also helping them to link with other parts of government, for example, health and WASH. So mirroring what we should be doing in terms of working with other sectors at this time. Whilst there are differences across the humanitarian development 
areas, looking at what's common and as much as possible using materials and adapting those materials. So for example, materials like parenting would be one. Just a couple of thoughts on some innovation, Sunny, if that's okay, of things that we're seeing so far. So for example, working directly with WASH colleagues and not just to provide mainstreaming guidance and checklists, but developing materials together and signing off on those materials together. Embedding animators with WASH colleagues at this time as they reach out to communities and work with communities. Working with health cluster um, around community sensitization. I, meant, I mentioned the use of technology and adapted programming around psychosocial support. Working directly with education colleagues around school closure and plans and preparedness on how to take that forward. Working with the food security cluster, recognizing that so many of the risks related to child protection are driven by food insecurity, child marriage, recruitment, child labor, uh, for example, in their plans as well. These are, these are some of the actions, some of the things that we are doing. I mentioned um, the help desk in different languages and Sarah also mentioned sharing materials and information. That's critical at this time. One of the things that we're doing is collecting country level examples of adapted programming. These are incredibly valuable because they represent an application of global guidance and tools. So collecting those and given that we have so many materials available, also identifying what are those top kind of key resources for broader translation. Sarah mentioned translation and we're seeing that's going to be needed in many, many contexts because we have so many materials looking at that top package of materials. We're also seeing distribution of self-care materials and messages to staff and organizations who are working with national colleagues as well. Looking at Humanitarian response plans and new response plans, including advocacy around funding, so working with coordination groups at this time to make sure that child protection is properly positioned in those response plans and funding asks. Overall protection monitoring, given all of the protection risks at this time, so working with colleagues in the protection cluster to scale up uh, protection monitoring at this time. I'd ask colleagues to share some of the links where those local materials can be can be shared, but also where people can reach out and get contact and support from others through the help desk as well. Great. Thanks, Michael. Very, very interesting. Fortunately, we have Rachel on the line. Uh, Rachel Harvey is the Regional Advisor for Child Protection for UNICEF's East Asia and the Pacific Regional Office, known as EAPRO. She has over 18 years of experience in research, advocacy, and programming on child protection, justice for children, and child rights in development and emergency contexts, including Central Asia, Africa, East Asia, Central America, Eastern Europe, and the Caucasus. Good morning, afternoon, evening from um, Bangkok. It's a real pleasure to me to talk to you um, and also have contact from my, my situation of isolation in Bangkok and thank you also Hani for inviting us to share reflection from the region to date on the needs. I think the technical note really provides great guidance on issues to think about and key issues that we've been really grappling with for the last couple of months in the region I'm not going to go into depth on those because I think you heard about them. But I wanted to build on some of those key concerns and actions raised based on the experience in the region so far. Um, a situation which really continues to evolve on a daily basis as I think it does for all of us around the globe at the moment. And things are evolving all the time. At the moment it seems that while children can be directly impacted by COVID-19, the biggest concerns that we really have in child protection are secondary impacts. And I just wanted to flag that the region is planning to undertake a study on these secondary impacts in order to inform the short, medium and long-term response for COVID-19, specifically assessing the direct and indirect socioeconomic impact of quarantine, of school closure for COVID-19 on children and on households. Just also want to give you a quick overview of, of the region in um, East Asia Pacific Every country in the region right now, apart from Laos, Myanmar, have officially recorded cases. Very recently, PNG and Timor Leste both recorded their first cases. Um, and same as other regions, but we're really seeing after a kind of a slow increase in cases, we're really seeing a rapid increase now, especially of local transmissions. 
We're also seeing with the rapid closure of businesses, the impending closure of borders and increasing restrictions, these are really driving migrant workers back to their homes in the province within countries, but also back across borders. And so we really can expect an increase outside the capitals and a wider spread of COVID-19 here in the region. And that might be similar for a lot of you around the world at the moment. What I also want to emphasize is the trajectory of cases is very fast and the need to prepare is right now, especially if you work in a country that's not yet been affected or only has a small number of cases. I have to say in the region, and we're not alone in this region, but four weeks ago, we were at a very different point. And although there was a sense that planning was needed and governments were looking at planning, really that sense of urgency wasn't the same as we see now. And of course that's changed. Of course, rapid measures have been put in place, but a lot of times um, governments are playing oh, catch up. Um, and also before we didn't really have resources that have been mobilized to accelerate actions, but these are coming in bit by bit and that's just really enabling us to do a multi-sectoral response and to really scale up um, quickly. I think Michael was saying there's a lot of material that's already been prepared. So a plea not to seek out, to seek out materials before developing from, from, from scratch. There really has been a lot of good materials done. They've been translated in a lot of languages. So reach out, but also share, because I think that this community is so important for sharing those resources to make sure that we're acting as quickly as we can, because we really have to move fast. One of the areas that I'd like to talk about is alternative care. I see that in the guidance, which is great. But there are three areas of alternative care that we're looking at in the region. Um, children in state-run care, but also in non-state residential facilities. Children who are in juvenile detention and children also who are in immigration detention. One of the things that we saw early on with wash supplies is um, PPE equipment with, of course, health facilities um, and the health sector were prioritized, but we're also seeing that children in these institutions are highly vulnerable if a case comes in and the need for wash um, equipment is absolutely critical. So we've been working with our country offices on a supply checklist and with our wash colleagues to make sure that those institutions both are given supplies as they come in cleaning equipment, not just to wash hands, but also to clean the institutions as well. And that those workers are equipped with the knowledge that they need, not just the care workers, but those looking after the institution and cleaning it to understand the spread of this virus as well. And we've been encouraging and working with the officers to undertake a rapid assessment to understand how many institutions there are, the number of children and what the needs are. So we have this checklist, which we are very happy to share. Um, We've also been looking about online training. Of course, we can't do face-to-face -face training, but we need to get that training to these institutions, also to social workers, of course, but just focusing on these current institutions at the moment. Not just about the general care of children, but also how to support the mental health of children in the institutions, but also their own mental health as well, because also they're going to be moving in and out of these institutions. One of the things that we found as well is that state residential care institutions are taken into consideration, but not NGO care institutions not instinctively. And we need those institutions to be considered in a couple of ways. One is to get those supplies to them, to recognize that their funding might be down, to recognize that their staff might disrupt it as well, especially in the event of shutdowns and curfews. So one of the things to think about as well is who is considered to be an essential worker or a care worker and to make sure that those institutional care workers are considered to be part of that workforce. Otherwise, you're going to have extremely tough situations in institutions that don't have the care staff that can work with them as well. Also, what we're seeing in juvenile detention centers and residential care is a stop in all visiting, which of course is understandable to stop the spread, but also obviously has an impact on children and young people. So this is an area that wasn't considered early on, but it's certainly been considered now how we deal with that as well. And of course, in the guidance um, as well, child care and alternative care is of course a big concern, especially when you have really rapid school closures before flexi working or before a closure of businesses also kicked in. Normally it doesn't happen at the same time. 
Um, we found a lot of work on flexi arrangements in the region. Again, happy to share guidance on this, and there's been guidance developed at HQ as well. One of the things that we know, not just from the region, but from others as well, is that grandparents are, of course, a high-risk group, and they tend to be the first port of call for care, but we know that that can be not the best option in a situation like this, and so your normal alternative care options are severely disrupted, both in a situation where you have rapid school closures, but of course where you also have parents and caregivers who suddenly become ill and not able to care for the children. So how we support those families and how we arrange other care is going to be really challenging. And in this region, we have one of the biggest regions with three-generation households. And this is going to also make it very difficult to control the disease as well. Another area which is in the, the um, guidance, of course, is around case management to continue the support and case management for child protection cases, but also, of course, recognizing the increase of risk of violence and abuse in the household and witnessing violence and abuse in the household, how we continue those child protection services, and it's extremely difficult. So one is to reiterate the need for social workers and community workers to be considered key workers, which has not always been the case instinctively in the region, something we're still advocating for. Also to recognize the vital role that NGOs are playing for very vulnerable groups, such as street children, children living and working on the streets, or um, desks and hotlines for violence against children, violence against women. And these are inevitably get, going to get disrupted. And how we work together and work with the government to ensure the continuation of those services. Another lesson learned from China is that, of course, again, PPE equipment went to health workers first. What they found in China, though, was that this impacted the ability of social workers and community workers to go into the community because there was a perception that these workers should be wearing masks. But also, as they go from house to house, there was a, a fear of these workers of contracting it themselves and spreading it, and a fear from the community as well. So it's how we manage the supply or what we are able to provide these frontline workers so they're able to continue really that critical role, um, both by keeping themselves safe and others safe as well. Some of the things that were used in the absence of equipment was also these online social social media platforms such as WeChat in China, which had already been set up for community workers to give them messaging, to give them some capacity building so that they understood um, what the risks were and how to protect themselves as well. The other piece is, again, going back to vulnerable children in need is a disruption of day-to-day -day services. So one of the examples is adolescent health services for adolescents with HIV AIDS and that these are not necessarily prioritized for continuation and that this can be, of course, very risky. So again, thinking about what those critical services are, both government delivered and NGO delivered, is going to be absolutely critical as well. Another issue to share is that as um, stricter security measures come in, um, these are usually being enforced by security forces, military and the police. And how we work with those bodies and agencies to promote a child-friendly approach, to have referral pro protocols in place for handling children that may be out with, without parental care who are living and working on the street. Also, possibly, depending on, on how this evolves, to also consider how WASH is implemented in the police stations as well. If there are a lot of vulnerable people moving through, if they're caught in curfews or strict security measures as well. And this is a, an area of concern in a couple of countries in this region. And the final um, issue that I wanted to talk about as well, that I think has been mentioned a, a bit is online protection. Obviously, online platforms and social media really provide a social lifeline and an education lifeline for so many children and so many families, but there is risk attached and there is an increased risk of grooming, um, of self-generated images, of possibilities of groomers wanting to and um, facilitating meeting children depending on the restrictions that are in place. And it's something that we need to consider as children and young people spend more time online as well. So I think those are the key additional reflections on top of the guidance that was provided that we've been thinking about and trying to respond to in the region. Thank you very much.
we are going to open up for questions and answers. There are already questions that are coming up. And I actually see something really interesting happening in the chat box. Given that there are almost 500 people, some people are asking a question whether, for example, there's guidance on this particular topic, and other people are responding to it already, which is great. This is exactly part of the part of the objective of, uh, of a meeting like this, where where practitioners can also exchange between themselves and exchange email addresses and uh, guidance and, and tools. So please continue doing that. Yeah, I've also noticed a few a few items in the chat box about where would I share resources, where would I go to, and I think it's really important to uh, Rachel's point that before jumping in and generating something, look at what's available. Maybe it won't be perfect, you might be able to adapt it, or, or there may be something already out there. So. In the technical note on the last page, in terms of resources, there's a bigger menu of resources that features the technical note that's also being updated. So that's really good to go to and have a look before sort of diving in and creating creating more tools and material. Absolutely, that's a great point. And it's just to save you the resources that you will spend on, on generating tools, just as Michael and Rachel suggested check and feel free to write as well to the CPAR, to us at the Alliance and ask if, if something is available or not. And if, uh, if not, we'll be very happy to even be part of the production of tools that you're, you're working on. So a question that I have here is from Roberta. Is there guidance on child protection related to remote web-based schooling? for unsupervised conversations between teachers and children, one-to-one -one teaching lessons, consent to what is shared and privacy of data. Just to say yes from education colleagues, and we can make that available most definitely. Um, it's linked with one of the, the points Rachel was making about whilst you know, online platforms pr provide a great range of remote work, including psychosocial support and continuity around schooling. There are also risks, but yes, from, from education sector and cluster colleagues, there's material available, but also at country level, materials on, on safety and security around online schooling education. Great. And maybe just to say as well that there's a, a school guidance that came out as well on key actions and messages for COVID prevention and control in schools and um, that was released I think just last week or a week and a half ago. And the other thing just to say as well for child protection colleagues is how we work with education when designing online schooling to build in the messages through actually the schooling platforms as well, not making it entirely separate, but this is a way to reach children and young people with messaging, not just work at the same time and this has been done in a few countries as well and we're working on on using those platforms um, to reach children and young people that's a that's a great point and almost finding opportunity at anything that other sectors are doing i think michael also spoke to the issue of cross sectoral work and the importance of it almost finding opportunities at any turn when any of the sectors are developing programs and seeing how we can complement that by ensuring that there is an element of protection and addressing psychosocial distress of both families and, uh, and children. I have a question and I have Allah who has his hand up. What child safeguarding policy will apply after COVID? Do you want to ask your question as well before I hand over to, to the respondent? Yeah, hello. I was asking about uh is there an SOP was developed uh, for the case management during outbreaks uh, for the uh, child protection? Some of the colleagues has answered that there is uh, one developed in Iraq and other one from the GBC sector. So I'm going to check on that. But if there is uh, one that um, uh, uh, like uh, on your reach for the child protection, it would be a great uh, opportunity for all of us to follow on, on it. In terms of um, safeguarding and facility-based centres, quarantine-like centres, we are looking at some of the earlier examples from um, Ebola uh, that may be adaptable. Things are, there's some you know, a lot that will be useful. Some things are different as well. So that's one of the things we're looking at, but also other kinds of centre-based care and, and what would be 
generally standard operating procedures, but including child safeguarding. I think for the case management, you mentioned some of the work that's already been done in Iraq. Yeah, and just to say, from I mean, we've been working just on the issue of child safeguarding also in institutions, as Michael was saying, that's something that we're accelerating. So hopefully between us, we'll, we'll have something quite shortly on on that to share because I think it's an issue of of significant concern at the moment. Yes, hi, this is Laura from um, Action Against Hunger. So yeah, I was I was wondering if we have guide like you know when uh, alternative um, group PSS with children. I was wondering when children cannot access the internet or they can, they don't have like smartphones. How do we ensure so, uh, social distancing? between the PSS worker and the group of children? Like, how can we access children with MHPSS services, but respecting the social distancing? Two things. So it's something that has come up and people are looking, one, smaller groups. So as as countries move into the phases, potentially toward lockdown, but from bigger group gatherings to smaller group gatherings. So the first one is reconfiguring PSS activities from larger to smaller and, and smaller groups. And then the other one is group activities with more distance and space, but again, incredibly challenging in settlements and camps and so on. But that's something we are looking at and for at the moment as well. So um, we're, all, we're all trying to look at those adapted programs and where that's possible. Where there's not internet and children can't you know, access PSX, PSS activities over the internet, what would be the alternatives? Radio, um, is that is that an option? Working with helplines to adapt rather than having single calls, having a group activities, for example. So I think we're, we're also looking for those examples right now. Yeah, and I think just a fair to say in, the, in this region where COVID-19 started in force, um, social media penetration was very high. And so we were able to reach people through social media and other, platform, other online platforms. Um, but now it's reaching communities that also don't have that access. And so we're also moving towards that as well. Um, so I, we also don't have any answers from this region, but it's something that we're actively looking at, especially as it reaches countries such as PNG and, and Timor. Over. And just, just to say on the Ebola experience, of course, it was in terms of the epidemiology of the virus, it was a very different ball game. But radio was uh, was huge in, in Sierra Leone, at least that where, where I was. I think we are all very much focused six years later than, than when Ebola started. We are all so focused on social media that we forget that there are other mechanisms that are more accessible in some of the more remote areas. So I think we should also think about those potential areas um, and maybe just on that yeah on that honey looking yes looking to, to different contexts where where radio and helplines are there and how we could adapt or leverage those right um to to the needs Absolutely. at the moment very quickly so i think i think that's it it's about how child protection actors who are, who are used to providing more traditional child protection services face-to-face -face, how do we help them and retrain so that they can at least part of them can can be shifted to to providing those kinds of examples that michael gave in terms of group group activities over phone or or one-on-one -on -one discussions and and sometimes counseling with because it's a it's a specific skill as well it's the core skills are the same but it's not it's not the same one other thing that i wanted to mention about ebola and and provision of uh, group activities is that again because of the epidemiology of the virus, it's risky, but you, in, during the Ebola crisis, uh, we managed to make use of a lot of survivors of the, of the disease in providing face-to-face -face and, and direct services because they're not, they can't be carriers anymore and they can't get sick themselves. Of course, children can, themselves can still pass it on to, to each other and then take it back home, but with precautions, it might be possible. Yeah, honey, while you're doing that, it's a really good point you're making around reskilling or adapting and taking the example of a helpline, which might be around violence and, and people calling in um, uh, to report or seek support or other 
other other issues. So also we may see greater levels of violence against children. So it's not that those services shouldn't be there. If anything, they may be scaled up. But how can we also have others um, being adapted to, to different sorts of activities? Maybe just two quick questions. Um, during emergencies, triathlon new spaces need to be closed due to lockdown measures. Do we have any alternative to that? Yes, yes. I was, uh, my question is basically, uh, what is, since uh, following this COVID outbreak, what is the adequate and most relevant uh, child protection strategy that is very much relevant uh, in this, uh, in, uh, in COVID crisis? Because, uh, because uh, most of the communities, they are locked up in, inside their homes. So there are, I see a lot of challenges in terms of every intervention. So what are the most to educate and most relevant strategy which is needful for uh, for community? Yeah. Great. Thanks, Ajaz. So we take that question, the question that I just asked about child-friendly spaces. Um, and then I will take a third question from King. If King can, you can unmute yourself. Honey, while we're waiting for that, I wanted to also raise um, a question that's been asked related to how to program in refugee and displacement settings. Right. Great. Thank you. And the last question we take now, King. How best can we drop a strategy to quarantine the children in our, in our homes? So maybe quickly on, on the question about what constitutes a good strategy. And of course, it depends where, where you are. And if we already have a humanitarian setting with all of those challenges or not, um, so that that's the first thing. But what we do know is the parts of the strategy need to need to involve um, the following, and we've heard about them today. One is that really intensive work with those other sectors that are out in the community doing outreach and shaping the nature of the response and their their water and sanitation hygiene but also sectors like camp management, camp coordination, and also education who may be uh, are working to have continuity. So the work with other sectors, I think is critical. And I think uh, the, the, the person asking the question started to mention it, government engagement in that process, um, critical. And then some of the identifying what are the key secondary risks for your setting. So Rachel mentioned some of some of the ones that she's seeing in countries in her region. There may be others depending on on your context. So trying to identify what they will be. So if you've got children, lots of children in institutions in your context or lots of unaccompanied separated children, whatever the case may be, I think that's critical for a strategy, trying to identify what will be those um, uh, uh, super risk. And then the other is two more things, adapted adapted programming how can you adapt the programming and then the last one is everything to do with messaging psychosocial support and parenting but also i think accurate messaging just about the virus because what we're seeing is the the absence of accurate messaging and fake news is actually creating lots of um additional challenges uh, anxiety conflict and so on so i think some of these would be the key elements toward a strategy on the question about quarantining children at home um so having children at home i think it's a question about and and rachel talked about the nature of households in a particular country or context are children typically with elderly caregivers or multi-generation so one of the things would be looking at um who who they would be placed with in a house, for example, would be one of the, the, the practical things I'd be looking at. I think the, what Michael said is right. It, it depends on the context. I also think just to reiterate the point that COVID-19 and the impact of it, the secondary impact, is, is one thing that's affecting children. There are also a lot of vulnerabilities that continue that started before and are ongoing, that are critical um, and so to be able to collectively map that, understand the services that can continue and how children can access them and what the barriers are and feed that into the advocacy rather than only focusing specifically on COVID-19, its impact I think is going to be critical for the well-being of children as well. Um, and of course, the, the, the advocacy around social workers and community workers and how they and to what extent they can continue to do their, their job as key workers, again, just to reiterate, that's an absolutely critical discussion. The discussion moves really fast um, in government and we have to be around the table advocating for it very early on, otherwise the, the opportunity will be lost. Thanks for reiterating that very, very important. Point, Rachel. There are a few questions about protecting 
protecting child protection workers uh, while they're doing their work and also mm -hmm. ensuring that they don't become an agent of, of infection going around. So we are working currently with the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance and the International Federation of Social Work to develop a particular guidance on that, on, on protecting our, our workforce. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we will have something to share. I think from, uh, I think it's Jose uh, mentioning that in LACRO in, in the Latin America region, one of the one of the key concerns is how to reach the most vulnerable in a context where the service providers we normally work with or through, which is governments and NGOs, are progressively closing down their services and staying confined. And remote and online services are very useful and valuable, but not for the most vulnerable. And that's one question. Another question that is coming up is if community doesn't have facilities for remote learning, is there, an, is there any option? Then last question I'll pose is, do we have some material already developed, especially on stigma prevention? So I was there, it's a really good point as government services and, and the typical uh, other service providers linked to government NGOs may not be providing services. What do we do? Uh, one of the things is in terms of looking ahead at the, the, the weeks and the months, those local community-based NGOs and do we have partnerships with them? Who has partnerships with them? I think that's going to become more critical and the nature of our partnership with those um, local, national and um, community-based organisations is critical, but also the preparedness as Rachel's talking about national level government, but also sub-national as they're looking at the weeks and months ahead, uh, who would be doing what and who's able to do what feasibly. I think on the remote question, that's come up, honey, so many times today. I think that's really around, if we have internet, okay, what would be the options? If we don't have internet, then what are the other options? I, I, I really think that's probably, um, as I saw that, I think you mentioned that's come up again. Um, so is that, is there some form of community animation? Is that uh, radio, as we've talked about, is that helplines using using different platforms? I think I think definitely that's uh, that's something that's come through clearly. I don't have more than what we've mentioned before and some of those um, some of those emerging examples. Rachel. Yeah, maybe just to, to add to that. I mean, I think that an, an assessment of the agencies who are there and the organisations there, what's absolutely critical and can't stop, and those that we're going to have to accept that it's going to be a hiatus or it's going to be more difficult to deliver. But also I think that what we know from China is that there is a period of really heavy quarantine, precautionary measures, etc., and then it eases up with, you know, China is going to go back to school in a couple of weeks. So however, you know, tough the next couple of months are mm -hmm. going to be or whenever the trajectory of the virus hits the country that you're working in, hopefully, but it seems from the China experience it's a temporary situation and we come out and children do go back to school. So again, planning what can be a critical support now that can realistically be delivered based on all of the precautions and the risks that are in place, but also recognizing the impact on children and child protection, child well-being that will come in the months um, all the way up to the end of this year and beyond that's going to be significant for children because the economic impact of this virus is going to be enormous. The um, disruption to family life, the breakdown of families, um, the increase that we have to expect in abuse and exploitation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So also making sure that we are trying to respond right now to critical needs, but also planning for that transition back into day-to-day -day life, but also the impact that the COVID has had on, on children and families and how we work with other sectors such as social protection, but also to work with social welfare to make sure they're, they're ready and can get ready to really support what are going to be very vulnerable at-risk families for many, many months uh, to come. And maybe, Honey, just to jump in on the mm -hmm. question which we didn't, we didn't answer about stigma. Some of the best material is coming out from ICRC and IFRC. There's other material as well about how to deal with, prevent and combat stigma. Great, thanks. Thanks for that. And maybe just one point on on the question that Jose uh, mentioned. I think it also goes back this issue of the most vulnerable children goes back to the to the question that we have been talking about, which is can we advocate and argue with governments to make sure that child protection or at least segments of the work of that child protection services and social welfare services are doing 
is deemed as critical work, essential workforce. And the same, then if we manage to convince the governments of that, then the same argument that applies to health workers, why health workers have to still go back to work. Of course, you don't want to send an 85 year old doctor with preconditions to work in this particular situation, but there are, there's a large body of our workforce that still can, with minimal risk, of course, risk is not zero, but uh, if the, the service is deemed essential, then that argument can be made. I am going to to just apologize. I will still read a few other questions, but we are about seven minutes before the end of the webinar. I just wanted yes. to mention that we will be going through all of the comments and calling out all the resources and the questions and answers that's been shared and organized it. If you haven't done so already, I would recommend that you do go to the Alliance website and register for this uh, webinar so that when the, the recording is uploaded and the resources are added, you'll receive an email and be automatically notified. So a couple of other questions. One is around... Um, children that do not have documents. So the issue of civil reg registration, which mm -hmm. is a very important question in this particular time, both registration of birth, but also deaths and marriages, which can have a lifetime, especially registration of marriages and birth can have lifetime impact on children. So that's one question. Jennifer is flagging the issue of sexual violence uh, perpetrated against children that can occur at home and she's suggesting that she didn't see this in the guidance note and it might have been missed. Thank you for flagging that. Another question from Marcello. Is there any video training, maybe short, that could be shared through WhatsApp for those remote caseworkers? Great idea. I mean, the, the issue of training and capacity building and retraining and reskilling is a huge one that I think we probably need to grapple with. How can we direct donors to support child protection during this time? So I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that and maybe for the last time. And if uh, you also, Michael and Rachel, have any general comments, um, your closing remi remarks, please go ahead. I think maybe a couple of reflections as I'm thinking about these questions is, as with emergencies in general, they're extremely challenging and tough, but they all do also sometimes provide opportunities for advocacy and investment. Um, and in, in social work is one of those to really um, demonstrate how critical that workforce is. But also, as, as people have said, the protection of that workforce, their own health, their own well-being, and also how we support them and the management of their work to ensure that you know we're not in, inadvertently spreading COVID either is really important. So a critical kind of balance between getting those services and critical support out to the community. So there's a continuation and the identification and response to cases while recognizing the need to balance health and well-being as well and how we do that in a responsible way and through both trying to provide the equipment that they need, but also the knowledge and awareness that they need as well to do their job so that they're um, safe. And in terms of birth registration and death registration, I, it, it, in this region it hasn't come up yet, but we would expect it to come up, although coverage of birth registration is relatively um, high in the countries in ASEAN that it's affected so far. And, but certainly it's an issue around the migrant populations, although some of them have gone back, we expect them to be a very, very vulnerable population as this goes um, forward. But again, a, an opportunity for advocacy for registration um, as well. Uh, but it hasn't been um, an issue that's come up yet in the region as well. And then I do know that in some countries in this region, they're starting to develop this online training. So in the spirit, again, of sharing materials when they're ready, we can also make them available as well so that we can start to share and, um, as Hani said, we adapt to the context that we're in and to the populations that we're trying to get to, the workers we're going to get to. But this should be also coming out fairly soon from the region as well. And but, uh, I'm sorry, just one more thing as well. We, we don't have all the answers. I don't think any of us do because this is something that we haven't seen before on this scale. Um, we can draw a lot of lessons from before, but certainly we're learning all the time. And, and as this evolves, I think we have to continue to share on platforms like this and communities like this so we can learn from each other. So um, thanks to Hani for, and the team for putting this together. 
Thanks, Ali. Echoing that, let's coordinate, let's share resources, new and evolving situations. So those those platforms around sharing sharing materials and adapting and, and learning together is critical at this time. For those for those in humanitarian context, do work with your coordination groups. Where you can, we work uh, with line ministries in government for all contexts. I think it's important at this time to look at those national systems and helping our government colleagues uh, prepare and, and link with, with other sectors. We've heard a lot today about adaptive modalities, where we have internet, where we don't. Um, so I think that is going to be a key a body of learning. We've also heard multiple times around, let's prioritize. Um, and I'm seeing in the chat box, there are cases that it's more critical that we have face-to-face -face time, but we've also heard we need to keep our staff healthy. So thinking about, yes, having staff continuing to, to provide, but those who are at lower health risks, but also thinking about case prioritization. There was a question around sexual violence, and we know that in humanitarian contexts, um, children are particularly affected by sexual violence, for example, teenage girls. So working with GBV colleagues is more critical than ever, looking at the prevention and response around second sexual violence. I think in terms of donor engagement and the global level, this is also both a critical time and an opportunity that we that we pull together and put forward the rationale and the reason for child protection to be central in our work, which we're happy to do with, with all of you, uh, at least in in the humanitarian context. Quick note of thanks. Um, much appreciated. And we continue to learn together. Thank you. I'll just mention three quick points. Please go, go out and advocate for the prioritization of critical child protection services, both in preparedness for those places that uh, the virus hasn't hit yet, and also response making sure that we don't we don't end up after a year with a lot of really severe cases of abuse and violence and potential death because we didn't it was not prioritized as rachel said this is really an evolving situation please excuse us if we didn't have answers for all of your questions we're all learning together so which brings me to my third point please keep your feedback and suggestions and sharing of knowledge coming to us and, and all of the global level coordination groups so that we can help others also learn from you. Thank you very much. We're over time. Uh, we hope to continue our, uh, our efforts through webinars in the coming weeks. So there will be opportunities to discuss some of these detailed questions that you have asked uh, in those webinars. Uh, stay healthy and, and safe. Uh, and thank you very much.